Hello and welcome to the Be Smart Spouse Art Show. My name is Susan J. Mumford. I'm just double checking all of my settings to ensure that I am actually using my professional speakers. Looks like I may not have been, so there we go. Welcome to the Be Smart Spouse Art Show. It is my pleasure to be welcoming you today on this session that addresses each and every week what is happening in the art world. And this week I have got three quite, I'd say, um, well, they're always informative, but they're this this week, they are, yeah, they're there's the finishing piece of news I've got for you is just good old fun and might even include yours truly. Uh, the other two pieces of news are really looking at what's happening with the art world in the pandemic. So we have got one piece by Art Forum, which is continually being updated. I have only recently come across this myself. And I really thought that readers of our social media channels and watchers of this of this program would really enjoy being able to see that. And the other piece of of news that I'm sharing is essentially from Art Critique. It's Art Hyphen Critique, and they are uh, in their in their case giving us inform information about what's happening in the art world um, during this point in time. And then, as I was saying, we'll finish up with a good fun piece about what kind of art people are really finding that's resonating with them at this time. So it's good old fun, and it's good to see some familiar faces who are watching this at the moment. So as I've started doing in recent times, I am going to share my screen so that you're also able to see the piece of news that we are reading today. So of course, this is when I always have to double check that I am sharing the correct piece of news to you here in the Be Smart About Art show. So the first piece I am sharing with you is an art forum. In order to look at this, you can see the links that have been provided into the news, news feed post today in Facebook. So it's artforum.com forward slash news forward slash and then it's coronavirus art world tracker canceled under scheduled events with hyphens between each word. Do check that link. And I'm going to read you the headline here, and you'll note that it was actually last updated today, and that's really a good sign of this of this tracker having been implemented many, many weeks ago, and they are still regularly updating it. I'm always really encouraged when I check something like this many weeks on and I find out that, yes, they are actually staying true to their word. They write, Art World Coronavirus Tracker, since its emergence in Wuhan, China, China last December, the novel coronavirus COVID-19 has upended numerous cities and countries across the globe. Among the various sectors that have been heavily affected is the art world, an industry fueled by perpetual itinerancy as well as social gatherings of mass scale and close proximity, moi, moi, I might add. As the public health crisis escalates, arts organizations have shut down events, have announced postponements, or are carefully trying to trudge forward, I would say increasingly trudging forward with new and different ideas. And as we've seen in this very program, some new online galleries emerging. We have now got online art fairs taking place. Last week, we were looking at Scope Immersive. I was just actually working on going through that exhibition myself. So there are definitely things starting that didn't exist previously. And that's the silver lining to the whole situation, which we wish was not here, but it is. So what can we find as a silver lining? And they continue, here is a continually refreshed list of major events and institutions that have made such decisions due to the virus, as well as a list of resources for artists and art institutions impacted by the pandemic. I do encourage people to share news of this because honestly, as I was saying, I hadn't come across this yet. I was doing a new search today looking for what's the news in the art world, what's happening. I was using different keywords than normal, and I just had not come across this previously. So, I mean, I think this is incredible. Um, here we go. So, rescheduled events, Venice Art and Architecture Biennales, I'm reading you some recent news here, uh, pushed back to 2021. Um, the Art Biennial will be held from April 23rd to November 27th, 2022. Um, so yeah, it's actually, that one I had read about a week ago, I would say, Expo, so not actually happening down now until a year after it was planned. I mean, that is some forward thinking, I must say, too. I guess with the Venice Biennale, uh, you really think about how much planning goes into those spectacular exhibitions, and they just couldn't risk uh, thinking that something was going to be happening 
next year um, but you can see that the architecture one is next year and the art one is now 2022 so that's the distinction between those two expo chicago which that was the same chicago event that i attended that my gallery participated in a satellite event alongside it many years ago i think it was that one um the annual art fair originally to take place in september will be postponed to april 2021 so we are beginning to see events that were due to place take place in the autumn taking place now in 2021 which does i have to say sound much more realistic to what we're seeing the problem being that even if you can have people in say a gallery and i was just hearing last week since our last show that there are many independent commercial galleries planning on reopening this september but of course they can implement the social distancing rules they're able to even operate by appointment only which i suspect many galleries will be doing but what about art fairs art fairs is just a different story because they're really to have the success that the fairs need, that the galleries require, that the artists require in terms of quantity and, 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 and such of cells, they just can't have the number of people that are required. And it would be too expensive to run and to participate if we were doing this at this point in time. So I can understand that that fairs are beginning to go, ooh, let's not take place in September, but next spring. And anybody from an art fair that's listening to this, maybe that's something to see as well and note. Sydney Contemporary, it was originally scheduled for September 10th. It's now taking place September of 2021. So that one's been delayed by an entire year. And indeed, I think that, that that brings up another point, which is one thing that we were hearing people saying when events this spring, as in spring of 2020, were initially being postponed to autumn of 2020. A lot of people were going, but wait, how on earth could you squeeze more into the calendar when it was already so busy? And I think that that's a very fair point. They were saying, well... Certainly, it's the case that it's not like there are going to be more collectors. So why would it be helpful if, if you crammed more events into it? So honestly, Sydney Contemporary, two thumbs up for just saying, listen, we're going to take place an entire year later. I think that, that is smart. And the Paris Biennale, that's going to take place, La Paris Biennale, uh, in September of 21. So that's been arranged again to take place in 21 i mean this is interesting and you start carrying on and on and on and you've got some things that are really being planned much farther into the future now you're seeing a lot of these events as i scroll through so you can have a look at them gently as we go a lot of events now not taking place in 2020 at all i would say here we are at the beginning of june and we're really beginning to see a quite significant change in the calendar, a, a change that we weren't seeing even three weeks ago. Now, needless to say, people, these organizations have been working on this, they've been planning. I know from an event I held on what actually turned out to be the very day that the UK started its lockdown on the 24th of March, I planned back, I, I decided back on February 23rd, February 24th, to move an event from being in person in Mayfair to being fully online. It took us still 10 days, to two weeks to actually get all the change over, to get the event set up, to get it all done in order to then communicate it. So whenever you see an announcement like this, know that the people behind it have been have been really just, just going round and round, just the world's been going round and round, getting everything in place in order to make those announcements. And of course, some staff have been furloughed. You won't have the teams available that you normally would for, get, for, for putting together the ideas, the announcements, for communicating. So in many cases, sort of much smaller teams of, of staff are able to even announce these changes. So it's a very different time. And I know something that jumps out in here that I certainly am very, very familiar with that has a great reputation for many artists and galleries in the UK is Art Brussels, originally scheduled for June of 2020, so that would have been this month. The fair will now take place from April 22nd to April 25th, 2021. And when I look at these pieces of news, I do try to read into them to go, okay, well, hang on, what do I think is taking place here? And something that I see in that one is that it might be that that's the only event that takes place in terms of quote-unquote art Brussels. I wouldn't expect that they would be holding an art Brussels art fair from what, what are the dates? Uh, April 22nd to April 25th, 2021. And then again in the month of June. That's too soon. That's maybe a kind of six, seven week lag in between the two events. In that case, what 
I read into that is that it's likely to do with availability of venue. If you think about it, even some musicians who are having to rearrange their tours, uh, one of the musicians who I have been watching some of the live sessions for is Narina Palo, and where she had one tour planned, the next available dates was kind of late spring, if I remember correctly, for, for, for next year. And so, so some of this is going to be down to some of the dates are going to be determined by what is available and you can see now this is actually this was announced a bit earlier june art fair basel switzerland the 2020 edition will run from september 14th to september 20th we don't know if that's going to take place or not uh, you've then got the list art fair switzerland art basel switzerland these are all events that take place take place at the same time with art basel being the mothership art fair will they really take place in september only the future will tell. So there we are. What, what are we distilling from that? I think that what we are distilling is that you've got organizations making very important changes. Uh, they're being realistic as well, recognizing the requirements of these big events that even if, let's say, the event could go on, that they would have to let in so few people that they just wouldn't make sense to take place. So they're really having to balance out the want of the galleries of the artists to carry on with with reality that actually this is a different world and until there's a vaccine and it's going to be very difficult to do these big events one of my questions is how are the how are the art fairs going to survive so only again the future will tell but let's move on to the next piece of news and this now i had not read this before and i thought it was worth looking at something different okay so here we are on the website of art critique it's www.art-critique.com so we've got here the art world roundup working it through the pandemic so they do a weekly roundup and i thought it was worth highlighting this it's, it's good fun to look at different sources of information of what's happening in our industry i'm going to read just a little bit of what they have on, on here and then we'll go look at our final piece of news after that. So we have here, um, now this one is, few, it was taken today, but it was a few weeks old, this one. It says, this is by Catherine Keener. Uh, for this week's Art World Roundup, we look at the ways individuals and organizations are uniting to tackle the issues around the COVID-19 pandemic, an auction offering unique experiences to support the International Rescue Committee. So that brings in this idea, and this is one of the reasons I like this piece, is thinking about what good causes you can support in the efforts that you're making at the moment, a really genuine way that reinforces your own, your own value set. So that's going to be something that is not already important in business today. but particularly at this time. So I am in conversations with some individuals about who might be putting on say an auction in the next couple of months. And if they go ahead, they definitely want to be supporting a good cause. So here you go, that's one good example. This is Google and Sotheby's have teamed up to present the May Day COVID-19 charity auction, an event that will auction off unique online experiences to benefit the international rescue community, a charity working to mitigate the efforts of the pandemic in some of the hardest hit places. Included in the auction lineup are a number of incredible opportunities. Uh, and I remember reading about this, uh, politically minded, you could get the chance to have coffee with Hillary Rodham Clinton, um, or an online chat with Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Al Albright being just this incredible mind. She was the first female US Secretary of State. I recently watched an interview with her. And she, I mean, she is, I think in her mid to upper eighties or so, and she's just got an amazing mind. And then the arts more your thing, bid on the opportunity to get acting pointers from Sir Patrick Stewart himself, record a song with Sting or pick the brain of interior designer Jacques Grange. Other experiences include a private virtual tour of High Clara Castle, best known to many as the fictional downtown Abbey and a conversation with Apollo 9 astronaut, Russell Scheichwart. And isn't that a great moment to be saying that we've just had a successful uh, mission launch in outer space with astronauts now on the International Space Station that happened over the weekend. And, and then you've got more examples here, uh, again, with, with funding good causes. Photo Focus, Nix's 2020, by, oh, 
to provide arts community its founding, but based in Cincinnati, Photo Focus is a not-for-profit that has supported photography and other lens-based art forms since 2010. Part of their programming includes a Biennale that has become the U.S. largest photography-based art fair. And again, let's look at what that's called. Photo Focus with an F at the beginning. Photo Focus. It's photofocus.org, F-O-T-O, focus.org. Do have a look at that. The fifth edition, which was set for later this year in October, but in light of the world con current situation, has forgone this year's Biennale. So probably I misread that at the beginning. Um, so it's not happening this this year. Um, and that is sort of the story of the world. So how are you needing to change your own plans balanced with how are you able to carry on with, with an interesting project supporting some really good causes? I think that that is a balance that people are needing to continuously strike. And now for the last piece of news this week, I think it's quite fun. I suspect the, part of the reason I chose this is I thought, well, this is the kind of thing, um, should be on the top there. Uh, this is the kind of thing that actually we would have selected anyway. And I thought, well, in that case, let's go ahead and choose it. And it just so happens that I am on the list myself. So Artnet News, and I, and I really wanted to finish with this piece thinking about how journalism happens, how people end up getting featured in the press. This is an excellent example of something. So yours truly is in this piece, it's titled 23 Top Collectors, Artists and Dealers Tell Us About the Artwork That Is Keeping Them Inspired at Home. And the sub title is we asked art world heavyweights to tell us about the artworks that are bringing them joy at home so that was published on may 27th last week so in december of 2019 i got to know an artnet news journalist named sarah cascone and now sarah i have read various pieces by her she's been one of the authors of various pieces that i have read in this very program so she was the moderator for a panel discussion in which i participated at art miami during miami art week and that's the first, well, actually, I think we, we probably met at an event in Miami right before that event took place. We got to have a quick chat. Then we met each other at the panel discussion itself. And then I arranged for her to do a talk in New York a, a few months later. Actually, it was the last event of One Network before the pandemic made everyone uh, participate in the lockdown. So Sarah and I got to know each other. And what clearly happened, so these these big publications what they do so artnet news is be, is completely online it's known as one of the top handful of publications specifically for the art world and art market and and so they clearly they, they have regular staff meetings they will they will talk about uh what kind of news pieces they're doing and they came up with this idea to invite various people in the art world to say what works of art are inspiring you when you're there at home you're having to you're having to be in front of these these artworks so much surely your surroundings are kind of they're impacting more than ever before uh what is really speaking to you so so they reached out the journalists selected who they wanted to talk with and they invited those in, those individuals who have appeared uh to submit a piece not so not to say that they did not approach pe more people there might have been individuals who were too busy to respond who didn't see the see the piece um, her, or for whatever reason decided simply not to participate. So we've got here a total of 23 top collectors, artists and dealers, but did how many people did they approach? I don't know. And interestingly, when I very first saw this piece, actually there were, tw they had 20. So they actually updated it with new material on the same day that it was published. So sometimes, that tells me sometimes there are updates to these articles, which I didn't realize. I thought they were published and that was it. And uh, this definitely went from 20 to 23 on the day. And what's so fascinating to think about is how it took place. It's not as if I had approached the journalist and say, hey, I would really love to do this. She came to me and think about it in this way. Are you ready? This is a top tip when it comes to getting press in the art world, we were providing, as in the 23 people, are providing the content for the piece. This is a really smart way of creating a journalistic piece. And not only that, because they've got 23 people, all with different networks, all with different social handles, et cetera, et cetera. So we've provided the visuals, we've provided the text, we have also 
shared it a lot as well. So suddenly Artnet News has got this piece that involves 23 different people, all of their networks, and we've done the writing for them. Of course, they did some editing down, but that's so smart and it's so much fun. It's a collaborative piece. So I think on so many levels, this was a great piece and it exemplifies how these articles come about. You keep people in your network, you, as much as you possibly can, you essentially maintain dialogues with them. And the truth is that the journalists are extremely busy. It's not as if Sarah was regularly hearing from me. Uh, she thought about me in, in terms of, she thought about me for, for including in, in this piece. And that was very, very kind of her. So I'll show you a few different uh, excerpts from the piece. And I'm just gonna scroll along here. Now that is Helen Toomer, her partner slash husband, and their son and I do know I do know Helen she used to run some art fairs in New York and Miami she at one time had a gallery as well and now she runs an artist residency program and you see Monique Maloche an art dealer uh, who I have met she's based out of New York the last that I knew so there we go so you can see some nice visuals coming along you've got Katie Stout as well and Katie is an artist that's a fabulous piece it's really, really good fun. And then you've got Marcus Raymond. So just scrolling along here to give people a kind of feel for this. I'm going to stop on one particular one before we get to myself as well. Uh, then we get to Javier Perez, who is an art dealer. So actually, I would say quite a few bright, quite a few colorful pieces that I noticed were being highlighted in this just scrolling along then we've got Deborah Ar Roberts that's quite lovely as well isn't it and then that's a, that's an older piece actually that's from 1990 okay here's who I wanted to highlight Marianne Ibrahim art dealer uh, you can see marianneibrahim.com and that is clickable so hyperlink now Marianne I she she started um, she started out of one city in the States. I feel like I know what city it was, but I don't want to get the story wrong. But what I will say is that she started in the Midwest and then she personally moved to New York City. I met her when she was exhibiting at an art fair in London. And I think that would have been in 2018. I don't remember if it was at, was at Somerset House. It was either Photo London or 154. I don't know which of those two fairs it was. And here's what she says. So the piece that she's highlighting, that's Gerald Gibbs. It's called Turner 2019. And that's at Marianne's home. And this says, Turner is the title of a painting by Gerald Gibbs. This was the first piece my husband and I bought before any representation. It was love at first sight. The painting reminds me of The Thinker by Rodin. Let's look at that. The Thinker by Rodin. I can see that. During these difficult times, it is important to reflect. I sit in front of this man seated on the green couch every morning and contemplate. So I presume we are seated on the green couch looking at this piece right now. The longer I stare at the work, the more the work comes to life. And so it's really fun and various little snippets in this article, you're able to get these personal insights. I mean, it's just really, really lovely. Uh, then carrying on, we have got uh, Zuko, Nakajima, and then we've got Jordan Schnitzer, uh, he's a collector. Then we have got, again, that's another bright piece. It really does seem to be a theme of so many of these, Eugenie Say. Uh, and you can see the titles as we're going. We've got Roxana Afshar. Now we'll say to everyone that uh, this, uh, that I was the final person highlighted. So I'm scrolling down rather a lot. Um, I so wonder, there's somebody who's a big time art world goer, uh, and that really makes me think of him, but I don't know if it's the same person or not. Casey Fremont, and our production fund, for anybody who knows that, Margot Norton at the New Museum. So a lot of these are going to be at stateside. In fact, of course, I got to know uh, Sarah stateside as well at that Miami event. Helen Toomer, there we go. So this is the piece that she selected. As I was mentioning, she has got the artist residency that she runs now. And that is by Zoe Buckman. Interesting. Let her rave series from 2017. Great. Isabel Bescher, director at Gallery 
Arshka. Okay, Anna Zrina, art dealer. So you really do have a mix, and these are all people from the art world, which is really, really good fun. I'm scrolling past a few more people just so we can get down to the one of yours truly, which I think is good, good fun to finish off with that. Uh, Sunny Raybar, founder of the Third Line, Beth Rudin de Woody, uh, Alexandra de Kuna. And this, I think, is great for actually being able to research a lot of artists, a lot of people in the art world as well. So this has got both. It's got artists and it's got the people in the art world alike. Sarah Maria Salamone, founder of Mrs. Gallery, which I have read about, which looks interesting. Celine Mo, founder of Victoria Plus Mo Gallery. And last but not least, here we are, Susan Mumford. That's my myself. And what this says here, so there you go. You can see me standing in front of this photograph. And that is by Chris King who is my other half, my husband as well. And I'll read to you what I wrote, which I think should probably evoke all that you need to know. Spending every moment every, of every day at home in Lewis, East Sussex, England, England, with the exception of essential trips, has reinforced the importance of immediate surrounds. The first week of lockdown saw the placement of a large color photograph, Answer Ignore, 2014 edition of five, by my photographer husband, Chris E. King. Oh, and that's a good note. We've actually added the E into his professional name as a photographer because there are so many Chris King photographers out there. That was the solution that he found when he was producing his book called No Opportunities for Regret, several years ago now. Situated at the top of the stairwell in the early Georgian house and opposite the bedroom and bathroom, the piece greets us throughout the day in trips up and down the house, bringing a spring to the step. The surreal scene of a phone box placed in a bed of brilliant green leaves takes on the seeming identity of a window that looks into another reality, all the while bringing a punch of color to brighten the setting. And there again, I've got that same theme myself. Most recently, it's garnered notable attention during video tours of the house. And there we are. And, and you now know the story of how that came to be as well. With an email, I noticed it. And that, what that goes to show is that it's really important to keep an eye on the different messages that come into your inbox. And when it comes to any interest from journalists, providing that you think it is relevant, that you think it's something that you do want to take part in, uh, jumping onto them immediately is important. And what I did in my case is I replied to Sarah as soon as I got the message. It was the middle of the work day. It was a crazy day, whatever day that was. And I said, hey, Sarah, yes, defo, count me in. I'll come back to you. And I also asked her for the deadline. Did I ask for the deadline on that one? No, actually, she told me the deadline in the initial email. Now, a top tip for everybody is whenever you send in that kind of information to a journalist, be sure to include for them how you would like your name to be presented, what website URL you would like to be presented. We actually had to make a slight correction on mine. And as I'm an entrepreneur in the art market, we decided to highlight two of the enterprises, not all three, as it's just a bit too much to overwhelm people with. So, so you do have to make some decisions about that kind of thing yourself. Um, I know for many people that, that won't apply, but if you do have different activities that you do, you, you want to think, what, you, what do you think is the most relevant for that particular reader, readership? So you look at that particular publication and then you make a decision on that and, and deliver upon your promises and if anything try to over deliver that's my recommendation to you so I said I would get it to the journalist by the deadline I got it to her actually the day before she she didn't give any of us a lot of time we had a couple of days to do it but I got it to her I think it was the next morning um and that's just really important to to think about how busy those journalists are I mean she was not really replying to me when she replied to me which was very thoughtful her and, and not necessary was to say hey it's now been filed filed they're expecting it to go live the next week that was really really kind but you will often find that you need to have on google alerts in case your name ever does come up in the press because journalists don't necessarily tell you when my own gallery got number one exhibition of the week for our inaugural exhibition back in 2006 it was only because the collector friend of an artist I know said to the artist, hey, it was great to see Susan in the Times. And the artist mentioned it to me and I said, what on earth are they talking about? And there I was, the exhibition wasn't number one of the week. So yeah, you, you can end up in the press and not know. Thankfully, in today's world, we've got Google Alerts and other systems that we can use to flag up those things. So all really helpful. And you never know 
when some kind person who you know might think, you know what, the work that you're doing is incredible and your name deserves mention. But if they're busy, they might not think to reach out to you and to say, hey, I've suggested your name for X. So be aware of those things. Everyone, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today's Be Smart About Art show as ever. I look forward to seeing you online in future events as well. Uh, do keep out your eyes for updates on our upcoming shows. This week we'll be running, of course, our Tuesday and Wednesday shows at the same time. Do catch our replays over on the Facebook page. So that's going to be Be Smart About Art. Sorry, facebook.com forward slash Be Smart About Art and join our members community at patreon.com forward slash Be Smart About Art where a lot of action is taking place as we say participate connect and grow so you participate in the, in the community you connect with others and you grow personally and professionally if you're not able to invest in the community at this stage at seven dollars and fifty cents a month don't worry that's completely fine you can continue to enjoy our online freely available resources we do say as our motto that we're here to help you thrive in a changing art world and isn't that true today I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Starting out from Lewis in East Sussex, I've been Susan J. Mumford. Thank you very much.